So we now look at a different greedy algorithm with a slightly more complicated proof of correctness. So the problem we are looking at is called minimizing lateness. So like our interval scheduling problem in the last uh, example, we have a single resource and there are n requests to use this resource. So now, unlike the earlier situation where we had a start time and a finish time and the resource had to be scheduled within this time, here we just know that each request i requires time i t of i to complete and each request i comes with a deadline d of i. Here we are going to schedule every request. So each request j will start at a time start of j called sj and it will take time tj so it will end at f of j the finish time of j which will be the start time plus the time it takes to process request j. Now if this finish time is bigger than the deadline then it is late. Right? So the amount that it is late is given by the difference between the delay and the finish time. And the goal is to find a schedule which minimizes the maximum lateness. So we want to minimize the maximum value of this LJ over all the jobs J. So since we know we are looking for greedy strategies, let's try and suggest some greedy strategies for this problem. So suppose we want to finish jobs as quickly as possible. So we choose the shortest job first. So we choose jobs in increasing order of length. So this could be a greedy strategy, but unfortunately there is a fairly simple counterexample. So suppose we have two jobs. Job 1 takes one time unit and job 2 takes two, 10 time units, but the deadlines are 100 and 10 respectively. In other words, the first job has a very long gap within which it can be scheduled without any penalty, whereas the second job has to finish more or less assuming it starts initially. So now if we pick the shortest job, right, then we are going to incur a lateness of 1 because we are going to go from 1 and then we are going to go from 2 to 11. Right? So the second job is going to finish 1 unit of time late. On the other hand, if we do 1 to 10 and then we do 11, then we get no lateness. We get lateness 0. Right? So here picking the shortest job first doesn't give us the best answer. So the second strategy might be to pick those jobs. So earlier we saw that we had a job which had 10 time units and it also needed to had, a, had a deadline of 10. So we need to pick those jobs perhaps whose time is closest to the deadline. Right? So we look at the slack, how much time we can afford to delay starting a job, dj minus tj and pick those which have the smallest slack. So here we have a very similar example to the first one except that the deadline of the first job is now 2. So here we have slack 0 for the second job and slack 1 the first job. Right? So the second one has a deadline equal to its time. The first one has a deadline which is 1 more than its time. So then by this strategy we would pick T2 first. Right? And if we pick T2 followed by T1 then what happens is that this lateness is going to be 11 minus 2 because we first do t2 so we start t1 uh, job 1 only at time 11 so it finishes at time 11 but it should have finished by 2 so the lateness is 9 on the other hand if we do t1 followed by t2 then we have that the lateness is just 1 because the second job should have finished at 10 instead it finishes at 11 so 11 minus 7 is 1. Okay. So now here, although our intuition told us to pick the smaller slack time, actually that's not the good one. So it turns out that a greedy strategy that does work is to choose the job with the earliest deadline D of J first. The challenge is to prove that this strategy is in fact correct. So to prove that it's correct, we'll first assume that we've actually numbered all our jobs in order of deadline. Right? So we number our jobs 1, 2, 3 up to n so that the deadline of 1 is less than or equal to deadline of 2 and so on. 
Now having done this, our schedule is very straightforward. We just schedule job one first, then job two, then job three and so on, right? So we don't have to do anything. Once we have sorted the jobs by deadline, we just schedule them in that order. So the job one starts at time zero, which we'll call S of one. It ends at F of one, which is T of one, zero plus T of one. Now S two, the starting time for job two is as soon as job one ends, right? So at F one, we start job two and it'll end at S2 plus T2. Okay, so likewise now S3 will be F2. We'll start job 3 at time F2 and we'll go on till S3 plus T3 and call this F3. Right? So we will just schedule each job as soon as the previous one ends in this deadline order. So since we are scheduling jobs one after the other without waiting, it is very clear that the schedule has no gaps. Right? It has no idle time. The resource that we are trying to allocate is continuously in use until all end requests are finished. Right? So now the claim is that there is an optimum schedule which has no idle time. Right? Because suppose you had an optimum schedule in which you had blocks like this where the resource was being used okay, and there were these gaps in between which were idle. Then it's very clear that I can shift these things forward because there's no constraint on when I can schedule things. I only have a constraint on when things should finish. So by moving things earlier, I can only reduce the lateness. Right? So if the blue uh, schedule with gaps was optimal, I can move it so that it doesn't have gaps and certainly my new schedule will have no more lateness than the blue one. Therefore, we can always assume that optimum schedule has no idle time. So now our goal is to actually argue that the schedule that we have produced by sorting in terms of deadlines and then using that order blindly is as good as any optimal schedule. So here in the previous uh, interval uh, scheduling problem, we said that we would not be able to guarantee that the schedule that we found was equal to a given optimal schedule, but we will just show that they're of the same size. Now here what we will do is slightly different. We will take an optimum schedule which is produced by some other strategy and we will step by step transform it into one that is the same as the one that we have produced. Okay. So this is what is called an exchange argument. Right? We start with some schedule and then we keep moving things around in that schedule preserving optimality until eventually we transform the given schedule O into our schedule A which we would get from our greedy strategy. So our strategy processes and schedules jobs in order of deadlines. Right? So we can say that the schedule O, the optimum schedule has an inversion. Okay? If it actually has two jobs which appear out of order with respect to deadlines. So there is a job I which appears before job J and O, but the deadline of J is strictly before the deadline of I. So notice that our solution, because the greedy solution processes things in deadline order, there cannot be any inversions in our schedule. But the optimum schedule, the arbitrary optimum schedule that we are presented with may well have inversions. So now the first point is that if we have no inversions okay, and no idle time, then the lateness must be the same. So now first of all, if we have no inversions and no idle time, then the only flexibility we have is to reorder because we are not allowed to put things with later deadlines ahead of things with earlier deadlines. The only flexibility we have is to reorder things with the same deadline. Right? We might have multiple jobs with the same deadline and we could pick different sequentializations or different reorderings of these uh, same deadlines. They would not violate inversions because they are equal. So inversion happens only when we have something strictly smaller coming after something that is strictly bigger. Okay. So the claim is that in such a situation, we cannot have a different answer because of even if we allow ourselves to shuffle jobs with the same deadline. So here is a picture. So suppose these three jobs, the blue job, the yellow job and the red, red job all have the same deadline. So here is one sequence where we do blue first, then yellow, then red. Here is another sequence where we do red first, then blue, then yellow. Now they all have the same deadline, so say the deadline is at this point, right? So deadline is here. 
Now, the last of these jobs, regardless of how we shuffle them, will end at the same point, right? Because we have their total, the sum of their times, and that will be the end. And the last job will have among these the maximum delay with respect to this, this deadline. So since we are counting the maximum lateness, right? The maximum lateness cannot change regardless of how I shuffle these jobs. Whichever job ends last will end at the same time because all of these are of the same length. I mean, the sum of these are the same length regardless of how I shuffle them. And therefore, the lateness doesn't change, right? So in summary, if we have two schedules which have no inversions and no idle time, then the answer in terms of the lateness we produce is the same. So now, if we can claim that there is an optimum schedule with no inversions and no idle time, now recall that our schedule A has this property. So A has no inversions by construction and no idle time. And now we are going to claim that there is an optimum schedule. We are going to start with O and we are going to produce from this some O prime which has no inversions and no idle time. And by the previous remark, since O prime and A both have no inversions, no idle time, they must actually produce the same lateness. Okay. So how do we do this? Okay. So first of all, we know that we can assume that the optimum schedule has no idle time because we already said that idle time is useless. We can always shift anything left, compress all the gaps so that there is no idle time. So the first observation is that now we have no idle time. So one part of this requirement is assumed, right? So the, the only thing that we have to worry about is inversions. So the first claim is that if O has an inversion, then in fact we have an inversion among two consecutive elements, right? There is a pair of jobs, I and J, such that J is immediately after I, but the deadline of J is smaller than the deadline of I, right? So we have something with a smaller deadline, which comes later than something with a bigger deadline. And this is very clear because if there is an inversion, right, then the deadlines normally will keep increasing and then somewhere there is an inversion, so it comes down. Right? So at the point where it comes down, we must have two adjacent things where the bigger one comes before the smaller one. Right? So when we, whenever we have an inversion anywhere in the sequence, we can find some point where two consecutive items have an inversion. Now, the next observation is that we can remove this inversion by swapping these two jobs, right? So if we have i and j which has an inversion, then if we exchange i and j, that is we put j before i, then now d of j is less than d of i and this inversion is gone, right? So it's obvious that we have removed the inversion. But what is not obvious is that this operation of removing this inversion by swapping these consecutive jobs which are out of order will actually not affect the quality of the solution. So what we need to ask is whether after swapping i and j, we get a solution whose maximum lateness is no larger than that of O. Right? So we have an optimum solution. We have an inversion, an adjacent consecutive inversion. We want to undo this inversion by swapping those two consecutive elements, but we don't want to change the optimality. So this can again be seen by a diagram. So remember that this inversion said that i came before j, but d of j was strictly less than d of i, which is why it was an inversion. Right? So we had this kind of situation. So we had some history, this blue history. And then at this point, okay, we had i and then j. So this is my original. And now I'm going to go from o to o prime by exchanging j and i. So now observe that d of j is to the left of d of i by assumption. Right? So d of j is strictly less than d of i. So now let's look at the lateness of j. So it is from the end. So i plus j take the same amount of time whether I do i before j or j before i. Right? So if I look from the deadline of j up to where j ends, then this length, this lateness must be more than the lateness below. Right? It cannot be less than because d of i is strictly to the right of d of j right? and the end point is the same. So if I look at the end point and I subtract the, d, the deadline point, 
the deadline point for i is closer to the end than the deadline point for j because dj is before d here. So therefore, by exchanging i and j, not only have I removed one inversion, I have also guaranteed that because of this, so no, notice that late, uh, no other job, every other job up to this point ends at the same time and every job which is after this point also ends at the same point. So no other job has its lateness affected by the swap. The only two jobs whose lateness changes are i and j. But they change in such a way that the overall lateness can only reduce. It cannot increase. So therefore, this is a safe swap in terms of preserving optimality. Right? So therefore, now we come back to our claim that there is an optimum schedule with no inversions and no idle time. Right? We know that we have an optimum schedule with no idle time because that's a general principle. Now, from the previous argument, we can remove every consecutive inversion without increasing lateness. Therefore, the optimality is preserved. Now, if we have n jobs, okay, even if every pair of them is out of order, we have only n into n minus 2, 1 by 2 inversions to begin with. So, we can systematically invert every one of them without affecting optimality until we get an optimum schedule with no inversions and no idle time. And we already saw that any two schedules with no inversions and no idle time must be equivalent in terms of lateness. Therefore, our schedule A, which has this property that it has no inversions and no idle time, has the same lateness as this transformed version of O. And since the transformed version of O has the same lateness as O itself, and O was optimal, our algorithm A also, our solution A is also optimal. So the trick in this problem was to actually prove that the greedy strategy was correct. The implementation and the complexity are very easy to calculate. We just have to sort the jobs by deadline and then read off the schedule in the same order. So sorting the jobs takes n log n as usual. And reading of the schedule just takes order and time because we just have to read off the jobs 1 to n after they are sorted. So overall we have an n log n algorithm.